evaluations and chemical and physical tests. The, uh, there's a section in the textbook on it, and almost any issue of the Journal of Food Technology will have uh, information on uh, this. Uh, Taranashi's book has a very um, uh, detailed outline of correlating uh, sensory evaluations and physical and chemical tests. What we're basically concerned with here is that sensory evaluation is quite expensive. Uh, if you set up a panel, it means that people are going to be out of their regular jobs in the plant uh, doing sensory evaluations for you. Uh, you're a highly trained part of the production team and you must take time to evaluate these results and so forth. And so it would be useful if we could find physical or chemical tests that would correlate very well with the sensory test and then use these chemical and physical tests as a quality control measure in the plant and save all of the panel work. Now this doesn't mean that you're not going to have to do sensory evaluation work. At some stage you have to do the sensory evaluation and make the correlation. So the, the, the sensory evaluation is always going to be uh, the, the first thing that has to be done. But once the correlation is established, uh, then uh, you can uh, not have to do so many of the sensory evaluation uh, tests. Now, we intuitively believe that such correlations are possible. The whole Fechner-Weber relationship, that there is something about the change in magnitude of the stimulus which produces a similar change in magnitude of the response uh, implies that, there, that the sensory response is real and that there is some possibility of correlating the change in the stimulus as against the response that you're getting. So what you're trying to measure now is something that's going to stimulate that stimulus. It doesn't make any difference whether you're using Stevens' power law or Fechner's logarithmic law. In some cases, we hope there would be a linear relationship between uh, sugar content and ripening of peas, for example. This time, and this is sugar content. Now, you might pick peas by testing the tenderness of the peas, time after time, and then when it got to a certain tenderness. But you could also predict the optimum time of sugar content, and that's a measure of tenderness in peas. And uh, because it, as the sugar content goes up, at some stage it will go down. This is where starch is being produced, and that's what makes peas unedible, is when you begin to get a lot of starch formation. So you might get a linear or a nonlinear type of correlation of this kind between this thing that you're measuring here and some other variables, such as time. Uh, and that could be used. There's another kind of correlation you might have, and this seems to be in certain kinds of things. You might have an all or none reaction, or you might have an indifference rating. For a, let's say that uh, you are running determinations on, you'd like to know when to pick muscat grapes. Well, for a long time, this is percent muscat, there will be no change here. In the, you can't tell whether it's higher or lower. At some stage, however, in a very short period of time, perhaps in a period of just a few days, the muscat will go up uh, and then eventually probably go down a little bit. This is an indifference range. No matter how many tests you make in this, you can't tell anything about it. And then suddenly you get this. Ripening of many fruits seems to be that way. If you're running pressure tests on ripening of fruits, uh, they'll give no response. That is, they'll, they'll be 15 pounds per square inch pressure, 15 pounds per square inch pressure. And then suddenly the pear will start to get ripe. And in two or three days, it's ripe. Uh, so the correlation there is not going to be a linear one. It's going to be an all or none one. There are quite a number of examples of the all or none type of reaction in the correlations. Well, now, the uh, limitations on these tests are 
on the chemical physical tests on one side as against the sensory tests on the other side. First of all, there must be some sound principle behind it. The old pressure tests were not based on very sound principles uh, for determining tenderness of meat because your teeth and your mouth are quite different than a pressure gauge that you're going to poke into a piece of meat. So then they developed the shear test, which sort of shears it. Now that gives a certain amount of the same kind of texture feeling that your teeth get. But many of you who've done any meat work know that nowadays they actually have artificial molars that operate just like your mouth operates. And they measure the pressure that's required for these molars to go through a piece of meat so that you measure the tenderness essentially like the human beings, only you don't have to have human beings around it. You can run these molars night and day. Uh, they don't get tired. Uh, they don't suffer from adaptation and so forth. So they have to be based on sound theoretical principles. Second, they have to be used under relevant conditions. You want to, you want to simulate as near as possible the sensory experience. And uh, the third thing, that you don't want to destroy the, the food uh, or modify it in the process of testing so that the test goes off uh, completely. And um, there are some cases where that has to be watched. Now in the sensory evaluation, this is a general rule for everything that we've said in this course. First you want to record numerically if possible whatever the sensory experience was. A Donick scorecard, a scorecard, a ranking, um, paired test, you want to get some uh, numerical value for the sensory evaluation. And you want to try and determine what are the objective features that this test is measuring. Uh, if you don't know what they are, like a, something like quality, then it becomes very difficult to make any correlations. And the correlations are not very meaningful. What I'm trying to say is these last two things that if you're going to make correlations, there's got to be some rational reason for the correlation. You can make correlations, as I've told this class many times before, uh, between the number of bathtubs in Hong Kong and the number of cases of typhoid in Edinburgh. But there is no causal relationship between them. And even though it shows that the correlation is very high between the number of bathtubs in Hong Kong and the number of cases of typhoid, in Edinburgh, that doesn't mean that there's any causal relationship, that one is causing the other to be high. So in making these correlations, what you were trying to find is something that is causally related to the quality or to the amount of muscat odor or to the texture or to the uh, sweetness of the fruit or to the softness of the pear or to the crumbliness of the cracker. You're trying to find some test that's related to that particular uh, response of the human being. And then you can make the correlation, but not until you've satisfied those criteria. And that's sometimes rather difficult to do. Uh, and you have to be rather careful. There are a lot of correlations in the literature, very high correlations, but they're not based upon any good sound theoretical reasons why the correlation should be. And we can look at them with a good deal of, of uh, caution. Just because mathematically it shows a relationship doesn't mean there's any causal relationship between the two. Now, there are some advantages of instrumental measurements. You can use them at high concentrations without adaptation. Usually you can use them for a long time without adaptation, just one time after the other, the shear test and so forth. The instrument doesn't wear out. Well, unfortunately, sometimes the instrument will repeat, that is, it will keep giving the same response, when other factors have changed that have changed the ripeness of the peach and so forth. Uh, the peach may be getting dark in color, and uh, in a sensory evaluation it's, it's deteriorated, but the test may still show that it's the optimum texture for canning peaches, but in reality it's, too lo it's been left too long. Uh, apples, for example, are being kept in storage. You'll still get the same pressure test for quite a long while, but the apple may show uh, a rot, internal browning rot, and not be at all uh, useful for making cider or for making uh, uh, apple wine or whatever you're going to make for it. If the correlations can be established, they save a lot of time and they save a lot of money. That is, they save people's work. And uh, so you should always
try and see if you can do these. Unfortunately, instruments measure usually only one value. Uh, they, you get several values when you're chewing. You get uh, texture sort of thing as to how quick it goes down, the juiciness you get there. At the same time, the central nervous system is recording all kinds of pleasant odors or unpleasant odors from it. Uh, you are getting some uh, 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 sensory response from how the meat is sticking to your teeth or getting in between your teeth and so forth. You're very sensitive to slight movements of your teeth to the right and the left and so forth. And at the same time, of course, the, the, in your mouth, the meat is being mixed with saliva, which is causing enzymatic changes in the case of starches and things like that and other, other things too. So that you're getting a multiple responses, whereas that little pair of jaws that are testing texture is only testing one thing. That's all it's testing, how much pressure is required to go through that piece of meat. Whereas in your mouth, you're testing a lot of things every time you bite into a piece of meat. Instruments uh, uh, react over minutes, whereas your sensory response is quite immediate. Just a minute, a second almost, that you bite into your, your food, you're getting a response, a fairly big response, and one which your central nervous system integrates quite rapidly. So that is a, is a uh, problem for them. The final judgment is always a human sensory evaluation. Some precautions now. The samples for both tests must be the same. Now this sounds absolutely elementary, but it's not so easily done. Suppose that you're working on, on meat, uh, and uh, you want to make this correlation. Um, do you, which side of the animal do you use? And which part do you give to the human tasters, and which part do you give to the instrument? And how do you separate them from each other? Huge amount of work has gone into meat sampling alone. Twins were used in one study here. We had a whole project on twins. You get twin, twinning in cows in certain cases. And these were thought to be better. If you're using animals, you have to be sure they're all fed the same, that they're all killed at the same degree of hunger and so forth, and with the same method of killing them, so that you don't get more or less lactic acid production and so forth. The next thing is you have to have sufficient replication. You've had enough statistics now to realize the importance of that. Not only the replication for the sensory evaluation, but the replication for the instrument, because the instruments do not respond exactly the same each time. They also vary, and they have their variability, and it's necessary to, to determine that variability. I don't know what I meant by the instrument and the human experiments the same. I suppose that on the same something in my mind there that doesn't come through. Use your regular trained panel. It is perfectly all right. <coughs> especially trained with this particular food. And uh, having considerable experience in the variables that are involved. The test variables should vary over the normal range of quality that you are of character that you're going to measure. Uh, you just can't measure them in a very narrow range because in nature you're going to get a very wide range of instrumental responses. So you have to get a human responses over a fairly wide range too. So you have to start testing the apples before they're ripe and you have to continue testing them until, they're, uh, until after they're ripe. And I've already said that the variation of the panel and the instrument needs to be, to be tested. Now, You've all done correlations, but let me just point out one of the really big problems of correlations. Now, maybe this has been pointed out to you. Uh, you get values like this in some cases. And the correlation isn't very good, as you can see at this particular time here. You want to make the correlation real good, just get one value down here and get one value up there. And then you're in clover. Those, just those two values. So you have to be kind of careful about this thing of the extreme value. So you have to have some more samples up here and get some variabilities down here too. Otherwise, these will have a preponderant effect on calculating the correlation coefficient. Now the unexplained error in a normal correlation is the difference between the square of the correlation and one. So the square, let's say you get a correlation coefficient 
uh, nine tenths. The square of this is 0.81. The unexplained variation is still 19% of the total variation is unexplained. So you have to have very high correlations for predicting purposes. Correlations of 0 0.92, 0 0.93, 0.94. Sometimes people have used correlations to, like 0.7. They think that's a very good correlation. But half of the correlation of the half of the, of the variation is unexplained when the correlation is only 0.7. And uh, it's not, not usable for predicting purposes. Uh, this is usually pointed out, and then we tend to forget it. We, we're so happy when we find a correlation of 8 tenths. But 8 tenths is not a very good correlation uh, in trying to predict what the response is going to be. There's still going to be 19% at 9 tenths of the, of the responses that are not going to be correlated exactly like you think they're going to be correlated. So you have to worry about that pretty much. The results should be applicable to all kinds of spoilage or, uh, and all the aspects of ripening in case of ripening. This is sometimes quite hard to do. You may have to make multiple correlations, not only just the pressure test, but the, the juiciness test and so forth, and make a predicting equation. So much of the variability is due to this, so much of the variability is due to that, and so much of the variability is due, due to this. Some years ago, Professor Baker and I did some work in this field, and it's quite easy to do, and it's quite illuminating, and it takes an awful lot of analytical results. We were attempting to correlate sensory responses to wine with the analytical characteristics of the wine. So we took the alcohol content, and the tannin content, and the total acidity content, and the um, volatile acidity content, and one other one, I can't remember the other one. We took five chemical characteristics, and then we correlated them with the sensory evaluations. And we were getting correlation coefficients of 0.6 and 0.7 in this results, which was quite good, since we didn't have, at that time, the most important uh, thing about the quality to correlate, and that was the uh, amount of odor from the variety of grape that we were using. We were using Cabernets and Riesling. Now, with gas liquid chromatography, we might pick out some peaks on the gas liquid chromatography and start correlating those with the quality. And I think we could build up the correlations to perhaps 8 tenths or even 9 tenths. Uh, and that might be very useful in some cases. Uh, rather than using a big expensive sensory panel, you're going to get these analyses anyway. And with modern laboratory techniques, you can get a huge amount of analysis in a very short period of time. Many bigger wineries, for example, have automation. Bigger food companies have a lot of automated results that just are recorded automatically. So that, and you can actually punch these into computers, and so you can get your correlations practically automatically with some kind of programs. So it should be applicable to all types of spoilage. It should be applicable to various types and strains. Of the, you can't be changing the instrument from uh, every time. Uh, you're changing from one kind of peach to another kind of peach, or one kind of pear to another kind of pear. Now, it may be necessary to set up separate correlations, but we would like for them to be as applicable over a range of strains and types of the food or that we, as we can. And what we need to have is uh, correlations that are differences that are rather large uh, between good and bad samples. Uh, if we get a very big difference in the sensory response between the good and bad samples, we should also get a very big difference in the instrumental response between a good and bad sample. That makes for much better correlations, where you use the whole range of the correlation here. Well, there are many examples of these kinds of tests now. Uh, we, uh, sensory evaluation is completely abdicated in the field of, uh, of color. Uh, we've set up standards for color now for ketchup, for tomato juice, and so forth, for harvesting tomatoes, and so forth. And we don't have a panel looking at the color anymore. We've established once and for all that a certain amount of color is necessary for acceptance uh, in the case of ketchup, in the case of, uh, of uh, tomato juice. And so now we run an instrumental color test. And if it comes up to that standard, if we get that much color, then it will go along to the consumer. Taste and flavor. These are rather more hard to do, but we are getting some new kinds of results on these that are quite useful. Uh, the use of GLC, I'd just like to 
quote from Dr. Um, Stewart's editorial of some years ago, that just because there is a lot of peaks, and Teranashi explains this quite carefully, it, and, and uh, this is a very big peak here, it doesn't mean that it's going to give very much sensory response. It might be water, or it might be a non odorous material. So you have to investigate every single one of these peaks. And he recommends that you simply sit at the exit port of a GLC to find out if these peaks have an odor or not. I'm a little fearful of that, as Ms. Pangborn knows, but some people still do it. Um, might be something toxic coming off sometime. <laughs> you might end up with it, or at least not pleasant. But there is no other way to do it as far as we know. If you're going to correlate GLC results with sensory responses, you're going to have to find out something of which peaks are important. Now, mathematically, you can also do that. You can set up computer programs that make every one of these individual correlations against uh, the quality of the product or the amount of coffee odor and so forth, and finally eliminate those that are not important for your correlation and the computer will tell you which one of these peaks is the most important one. There's been a lot of that work. Powers has done some of that work down in, um, in uh, Georgia, and there's a lot of other people who have been working on that sort of thing. Well, you cannot afford to be in a quality control laboratory without correlating chemical and physical tests with each other. You simply have to have that kind of uh, thing going on. It's too expensive to do sensory tests all the time. And sometimes you get very good correlations, worth predicting with, 0.9 and above. And in those cases, use them. OK, now Mrs. Pangborn has your paper. Any last minute questions before our quiz?